Now with all the bad rep going around about CVT transmissions failing, you'd think that Toyota would make a very reliable CVT. How we got a CVT transmission out of a 2017 Toyota Corolla with 170,000 kilometers on it and it does not have reverse. Now my bets are that the Ford reverse clutch inside of here is probably burnt up but the rest of the transmission is fine. So we're going to be tearing down this transmission to see what's inside, how it works, and just why it failed. Taking a quick look around here, this is the input side here where the torque converter is. The engine would bolt up to here. We've got our passenger side axle and our front and rear transmission mounts. Now around the back here, there's another transmission mount that would bolt up here. Toyota really didn't want this transmission going anywhere. Around the side here, we do have a transmission cooler, Hem Hem Nissan, you should take note. And at the top here, we do have the park neutral switch, which is where the shifter cable would connect to. Now around the back here is where the two CVT variators are. This is the input side here with its speed sensor, and the output speed sensor is here. And of course, there's a transmission vent tube and the driver's side axle plugs in there. So now that I've just given you a 360 tour of my garage, let's tear this transmission down. I'm going to pull out this torque converter. Anybody want a torque converter? Oh, there's junk inside here. Yeah, you don't want that. All right, let's get this tranny cooler off. Why do I have a feeling that this pry bar is going to be my friend for this teardown? All right, so here's how this works. We've got coolant in, coolant out, fluid in, fluid out. Oh, the fluid is nice and bright red. That's good. Essentially, what happens is the warmth from the coolant is going to be exchanged with the transmission's warmth, and they're going to warm up each other depending on who's warmer. Now, in some cases, this could be a failure point and mix. And then you've got a milkshake inside your transmission. Looks like the ground wire for your battery. There's the input sensor. That's the hook up to the valve body. They always get you with these little wire brackets that are in the way, ready to rip your glove. Let's remove the park neutral switch. This is a 22 millimeter nut. Again, use the pry bar. Come here. So it'll work just to get a park neutral switch off. I'm going to give it a little juice here and let it soak before we have to resort to violence later. Moving on, I'm going to remove the bell housing. There's a bunch of 12s on the inside and the outside over here. Well, sometimes you're going to have to resort to hand tools. Ugh. Don't you wish there was a power tool that could take that off? I'm going to flip it upright. Hopefully it doesn't fall off the table. Let's see how much liquid comes out. All right, while I'm here with the 12, I'm also going to remove these transmission fluid pump bolts. So I'm back with my crowbar friend here and my other crowbar friend. Don't do anything you see this tool do at home. This is for demonstration and educational purpose only. Let's take this off. So it looks like inside here we do have the, no, we do have the fluid pump that's integrated in here. The transmission fluid is looking a little bit on the poopy side. I ran into the kitchen and I got something that looks like a towel, but this stuff is really absorbent. Just sap that up. Look at that. The table's so clean now. Now one thing with CVTs is that they're much lighter and very simple. Here is the input shaft that comes from the engine. That input shaft is going to go to the variators that we saw at the back of the transmission and come to this output gear here. There's the counter gear and then the final drive where the axles plug into. Let's see if I can remove this counter gear here, it just pops off. And the final drive which is this open differential. Now if you want to learn more about open differentials, check out my video linked above. I did a nice video on this. Alright, let's remove this forward reverse clutch here. And you can see it's pretty burnt up. It's a dark, dark color. So we do have a planetary gear set that has to sit in front of a CVT and that's to allow it to go forward and reverse. Here we have the sun gear for that planetary gear set and there's a clutch for it. And then inside of here we have a planet carrier. You can see the little planets here. It's a bit of a compound design where you've got a smaller gear on the inside here that interfaces with the sun gear and then the larger gear on the outside here interfaces with this ring gear. I can take out this ring gear. There's the ring gear. All right, let me get the snap ring out of here. I hate snap rings, they're so dangerous. So there's an input sensor over here. And it's actually full of metallic flakes, if you look at it. Uh, but that's what's blocking this clutch from coming out. So I will have to open the valve body to get that sensor out from the back side. It's a good thing that Toyota's still using stamped steel as opposed to switching to plastic. Like some other domesticated animals. I'm just gonna remove all the 10 millimeter bolts. See? pan off. Oh, we got mess. All right, so while that drains, we're going to take a look here at these magnets that are built into the pan. You can see they do have a little bit of metallic particles on them, indicating that there was some metal run through here as those clutches bore out over time. So it looks like the wiring harness leads up to five solenoids. I don't know how they want you to release those tabs, but they just crumble. Now this giant thing here is a transmission filter, and it's got a little piece of felt cardboard inside of there. This is where the video is going to get a little nasty and oily. So viewer discretion is advised. 
pop that off. Essentially, it's going to suck up fluid from the bottom here and then send it in through this hole to the valve body here. Somebody tell me if that's OEM. That does not look like an OEM filter to me. So here's another thing the other companies could learn. A replaceable filter underneath the pan that you can easy access from underneath. You don't have to split the case in half to get this off. A lot of other companies, even automatic transmissions, don't even have this kind of replaceable filter. At least Toyota stuck to it, even in the newer CVTs. And here's a look at the valve body itself. Now something tells me it's not supposed to be this poopy color. It should be more like this silver color or like the casing itself. So somebody's not been keeping up with their transmission fluid changes and has been overheating this transmission. And there's a bunch of 10 millimeter bolts that hold this thing together but also hold it to the case. And I have no idea which one's which, so I'm just going to pull out everything. As you can see, my gloves are getting slippery. Pull out this valve body. Oh, you can see there's more bolts on the top. Well, I can tell you it doesn't smell burnt in here, but it sure looks burnt. This here is the sensor, which is likely a speed sensor. Oh boy. Remove the sensor. Taking a look inside the valve body here, these two big holes are the ones that go to and from the fluid pump that sits on the front of the transmission. And all these little ports here are ports that go to either the clutches or to the variators themselves to fill them up and change the gear ratio. Alright, so now that sensor's out of the way, we can grab the next set of clutches. That comes out. Yeah, these clutches are burnt. One more steel plate. Okay, I was able to get it out. Those are the piston return springs. Pull out this piston here. Now taking a look at the clutch itself, the steel bands, they look okay, but the friction discs don't look okay. You can see they're very dark on the outside here. If you move over to the second one here, you can see it's actually worn all the way around here, a nice steel ring where it's burnt off all that clutch material. The last one over here is completely burnt off all of that friction material. Remember, it's supposed to be nice and brown like the teeth over here, but instead it's actually completely burnt out. It's actually got a bit of a conical shape to it, and that's all just from the piston trying to apply some pressure, but because they're friction can no longer hold any torque it's just spinning and spinning and spinning away looking at how the planetary gear set works we got the input which is the sun gear and the output which is the planet carrier now if i apply this clutch inside of here it's going to lock the input and output together and the whole thing is going to rotate as one assembly which is going to give me drive in forward however if i lock up this reverse clutch that means that the ring gear is going to be held stationary and look what happens the output here is now moving in the reverse direction from the input and that's how i get reversed however because that clutch is completely burnt out that means the ring gear is not lock into the transmission casing I'm only getting to go forward and of course there's no reverse pulling this thing apart here you can see you've got the ring gear which is going to spline to that clutch and here we have the planet carrier this is going to spline to the first variator on the input side and it's got teeth on it which are going to spline to the clutch on the inside here right, let's take a look at that forward clutch Honestly, the Ford clutch is not looking in the best of shape either. You can see that the friction materials are starting to wear down pretty aggressively. And of course, if you left both of them disengaged, you'd have neutral. Now, in order to activate this clutch, we have the piston on the inside here. Fluid is going to be sent through these holes in the center of this shaft over here to fill it up, and that's going to press up against that clutch to lock it. So now that we remove the front half of the transmission, let's remove the variators, which come off the rear here. And here we have the guts of this continuously variable transmission. Essentially, this is your primary variator where the planet carrier is going to attach to. The belt ratio is going to determine how fast the output goes, and that's going to be geared to the differential to turn the wheels. So if you look closely, there's a slight cone on the variators over here, and there's also a cone on this belt. Now, this is a push belt system, so essentially you have to have a lot of pressure on this belt here, and it's going to push all these little pieces on this belt over here in order to transfer torque over to the secondary variator. It's kind of different than your alternator belt where you're always pulling it. Now you always have to have tension on this belt otherwise it's going to slip. Remember this whole thing's encased in fluid and these are metal to metal surfaces. It's not like a rubber belt where you have grip. So fluid quality and of course fluid pressure is very important in a continuously variable transmission. So let's say we're in the first gear ratio, which is what we're at right now. We've got the smallest cog on the input and the largest diameter on the output. That's going to give you a torque multiplication, but this gear is not going to move that fast. You've got to move the engine really fast. That's great for a reverse gear or a forward first gear. Now as you speed up, you're going to want less torque and more speed on the drive gear. So you're going to have to apply some fluid pressure to the first variator over here. That's going to squeeze the belt and force it to come more towards the outer diameter, kind of like what you see on the secondary variator here. And on the secondary side, you're going to relax the pressure. That's going to allow the belt to go more down inside of the cone. So you're going to have a larger diameter on the input and a smaller diameter on the output, kind of the reverse of what you see here. Notice if this was reversed, and let's say this was the input, the bigger gear is going to spin the smaller gear a lot faster, which is ideal for an overdrive ratio. I mean, it's not like a Corolla would be going that fast on the highway. They're always sitting on the left lane blocking traffic anyway. 
anyways. Also to note, we do have this big arm here, which is the parking pole, and that's gonna lock the output shaft over here so you don't roll away on your neighbor's driveway. I'm going to flip this around this side because the variators themselves are actually held on by a couple of bolts. Of course I can do that on camera, but with the help of this crowbar, once again, I was able to get that off of the casing. Now these are pretty much stuck together. The reason is there's a giant spring inside of the secondary variator that's clamping this down. So if I could get this belt off of here, that would be sick. Let's see if we can get this belt off of here. Yeah. And before we investigate, I'm going to zip tie this belt because the last time one of these exploded on my driveway, I had to pick up 300 and something pieces. And there's probably still more out there. Taking a closer look at the CVT belt, you can see it's made up of many different pieces over here. And they've got a profile on them with an edge here, which is going to match the conical edge on the variators. All of these little pieces here are held together with these two steel bands that go around the whole belt. It's only the pressure of the variator squeezing them that's holding all of these pieces on that steel band. So this here is the primary variator. There's no spring in it, so I can show you how it works. It's basically a giant piston inside of here. If you fill up fluid from the transmission casing inside of here, it's going to push the variators together like this. Now because they have this cone angle, it's going to force that belt to ride from the lower diameter all the way up to the higher diameter and you can vary how much pressure is in here, hence the word continuously variable transmission. And by varying the amount of pressure inside of here, you can vary the drive ratio. Watch as I push the piston back and that would allow the belt to relax back from the higher diameter down to the lower diameter. Of course this is a piston, it's got seals and it could leak, so if you want to check out more about how those fail, check out my Jacko Nissan teardown video linked above. Now the secondary variator is a little bit more interesting because it's got a giant return spring inside of this bell housing over here and that always applies pressure over here. You can see this one's always compressed to give you the lowest gear ratio possible. Remember the larger diameter on the secondary means that the smallest diameter on the primary which is going to give you a good gear ratio so that you can get off the road, park at the zoo and watch pigs fly while you wait for the tow truck. Now I can't really remove the spring in here because the last time I did on the Jatco teardown that spring went flying and it was really dangerous. Essentially you need a giant pulley puller to pull this back to its broadest amount then remove the snap ring and then relieve the spring pressure down to get this out safely. But hey what's a speed car video without an angle grinder? I'm gonna see if I can remove this large nut on the primary variator. It smells like burnt cow here but this thing literally just fell apart while I was grinding it. Here we've got the bearing race. It busted a nut. So what's left here is the bearing race. So I'm going to cut that off because it looks like it's pressed on. So that's uh, smoking hot. So I'll remove that. Yay. Oh, there's fluid. And this piece pops off like that. And then we have this piece over here that sits on the back with the bearing, which is stationary. So essentially the cavity in between here and the piston is what's going to fill up with fluid. So I found something. There's probably clutch material or some other forward material, but it's built up inside of the piston itself. It's like sludge inside of an engine. That looks bad. Let me just shine this up with the old towel a little bit so we can have a closer look at the surfaces here. Here we have sort of the cylinder. This remains stationary. I don't really notice too many vertical grooves or anything. So this looks like it's in pretty decent shape. And here we have the piston itself. So if you look on the side here, there's no rubber, it's actually just metal itself that's touching this metal over here with of course the lubrication of the ATF. Now on Nissan vehicles they actually use rubber and those rubbers fail and then you can no longer hold pressure in the variation. So it's good that Toyota was able to come up with a sealing system that doesn't have that failure point. Now the other huge difference on the Jatcos versus this one is that you've got a full on gear teeth over here and inside of here that's splined so this moves up and down easily but it's also got enough teeth so that it can transfer torque and not wear. Now surprisingly on the Jatco transmissions they don't have any spline. Instead they just have three grooves that have steel ball bearings on them and those ball bearings after a while, this thing's moving back and forth, a little bit of vibration, the races and the balls themselves start to wear out. Then you get a shuddering sensation and eventually the balls are going to drop out and fail and then it can no longer hold any torque. I'm very glad that Toyota didn't go in that direction with these variators because those were really obvious failure points. So on the side casing here you can see these are the bolts where the variator is bolted up to. These here are the oil galleys that are going to bring oil in the shaft in order to fill up those pistons 
so you can change drive ratios. You've got a little sprout over here to help cooling of the belt and of course that parking pole arm. That arm locks into these grooves here on the secondary variator. So let's move on to the valve body. It's essentially the brains of the transmission. It's going to move fluid around different passages in order to lock up the torque converter, the planetary gear set clutches, as well as move fluid into the variators when you want to change drive ratio. Now it commands those things through these solenoids over here which are going to redirect fluid through this maze of a brain. So let's open this up to see how it works. By the way, this is where the park neutral switch would come into. It's actually got a manual valve inside of the valve body. Just pull off this whole plate here. All right, we'll pop this off here. Got a steel plate in between. Oh, that looks like a filter inside of there. Check balls and another filter inside of here, but I noticed that this thing has some cholesterol. Check out the gunk inside of this artery area over here. This is likely clutch material that burnt and it got through the oiling system and made its way over here. And then we've got one over here. You would have thought that maybe you could have got away with replacing some clutches on this thing and just sending it, but yeah, all this stuff gets clogged up with clutch material when you start burning clutches. All right, back up at the front of the transmission casing here, we have the fluid pump. I believe this should just pop out. Yeah, don't watch that front crank seal that just popped out. That's from a Mercedes. It's got a really interesting failure, so you might want to stay tuned for that video. The rest of this casing is, well, as boring as a Corolla is. There's not much inside of here besides some bearing races, a baffle splash for the final drive, and that's pretty much it. To the scrap bin it goes. And just like your heart, the fluid pump is the heart of the transmission. Now, on the back here, we do have the stator, which hooks up to the torque converter. If you want to learn more about that, I've got a really cool video that's cooler than today. Check that out. I'm going to remove these 12s on the back of the pump here pull this out here you see the stator is actually part of this piece and we've got a gear style oil pump inside of here so this is going to be splined to the input shaft and it's going to rotate how this works is you've got little cavities inside of here and as it rotates over here it kind of squeezes that fluid down inside of this housing over here and that's going to push fluid to the outside directly into the transmission casing which is going to go to the valve body as we saw earlier now one thing i note is that there's no pressure relief like there is on an oil pump on a car it just keeps spinning faster and faster. I wonder if the valve body's got a pressure relief valve. Finally, I'm gonna chop the transmission filter open so we can see its condition because if there was cholesterol inside of the brains and the arteries, pretty sure there's gonna be cholesterol right inside the mouth. And boy, my lucky transmission fluid is not combustible. Uh, I triggered my fire alarm, so I wonder if uh, that's pretty bad for my health. All right, so while I've opened the garage and we're ventilating, pop this transmission filter apart. Looking at the filter material, it looks pretty loaded. I'm pretty sure a lot of this is clutch material inside of here that I'm wiping off. So here's a little explanation for you bookworms out there. Here is a cross-sectional view of those 300 something odd pieces that make up that CVT belt. Here are the two steel belts on the outside here that hold everything together and there's also an alignment dot. All of them come together to create a cone angle which is going to match those on the variator. So here's a cross-sectional view of the variators. This one here is the stationary side and this one here is the one that moves with the piston. Now if we relax all the fluid inside of here and allow this variator to come out, we've got a large gap in between here so the belt tends to drop down over here. Remember, you've always got to keep the same cone angle on here, and that's going to allow for an outside diameter of, let's say, D1 for a low drive ratio. Now, the valve body commands, we can apply a lot of fluid inside of this piston to push these two variators together, creating a very small gap over here. Now, because of that cone angle, it's going to push that belt out to a much higher diameter. Let's call that D2 for a higher drive ratio. Now, you got to remember that the length of the belt as well as the distance between these two variators never change. There's no stretching of the belt or any magic tricks like that. So let's say on our primary side, we have a very small diameter D1 and our secondary side, we've got a large diameter D2. That's going to give you a torque multiplication, which is great if you're taking off from the stoplight. However, let's say you're getting up to speed in your Corolla and you see a Prius on the road with one of those eCVTs and you want to pass them. Well, you're going to increase the diameter here to let's say D3 on the primary side and decrease the diameter on the output side to give you a D4. And that's going to give you more of an overdrive ratio so you can speed up and pass that Prius. Now, the reason why we use CVTs is, yeah, they're lighter, they're cheaper, but it's because of the limitations of the internal combustion engine. You got a very limited amount of RPMs on that engine that give you great fuel economy, but also good power. And in order to optimize those two, you got to continuously be changing the drive ratios between these two in order to answer the commands of the driver's foot on that throttle. So if he wants power, you got to give him this kind of gear ratio for more torque. 
If he wants fuel economy, you gotta give him this kind of gear ratio to cruise on the highway. And that's a look inside of the K313 continuously variable transmission from Toyota. Now, in my opinion, the owner likely got this stuck in snow and combine that with the clear lack of transmission fluid changes, it allowed all the particles to go inside of there and clog other things up. Toyota's been making this transmission for a while and they've generally been reliable and they do have quite a robust design. Now drop a comment down below if you got one of these transmissions in your car and let me know how it drives. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.